hello and welcome everyone to another session in this data r series we are thrilled to be here with you this evening for a session full of action packed learning i am ketak gunjar part of the data science team at analytics vidya and i will be moderating this session along with my colleagues rishab and monish for those who have joined us for the first time a brief introduction about the data r sessions the data r is a series of webinars conducted by analytics vidya led by top industry experts it is a fun way to understand the concepts of data science from the leading players in the data tech domain and as name suggest this is one whole hour dedicated to only data we are hopeful that these sessions are going to be a great source of enrichment and value adding for our community members now on to our session today which is building nlp applications using hugging face in this data hour julian our speaker will introduce you to transformer models and what business problems you can solve with them then he will show you how you can simplify and accelerate your machine learning projects end to end which include experimenting training optimizing and deploying along the way he will also run some demos to keep things concrete and exciting for you i hope you are excited to attend this data hour with us now on to our speaker in this session we have julian simon with us julian is currently chief evangelist at hugging face he is recently spent 6 years at amazon web services where he was the global technical evangelist for ai and machine learning prior to joining aws julian served for 10 years as cto or vp on large scale startups also so over to you julian the virtual stage is all yours hello julian Hi Julian. I think you are you able Hi, to Julian. unmute yourself? Hello. Uh Yeah, hi Julian, you can start your session. Okay, should we get started? Let me know. <laughs> Ready to go? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Julian. Yeah. Uh, are you able to hear us? Okay, I guess uh, this one will work for us. Yes, I think you can start, Julian. Okay. All right. I'll take this as a yes. <laughs> okay. So let me share my screen and. we'll be starting right now okay here we go all right you should see my screen now okay uh double checking everything yeah let me get this out of the way i want to keep the chat window open if i can all right here it is okay let's get started so uh well i, I guess good morning good afternoon probably good evening uh we have uh, lots of people from all over the world that's amazing thank you so much for joining um i you know i never thought there would be so many people on the on the session so thanks again um and thanks for uh, you know showing up even if it's very late where you are <laughs> really appreciate it i'm based outside paris it's uh it's mid afternoon for me right now and uh, so in this session i'm going to try and introduce you to um hugging face and um and how to build nlp applications so let's start with uh, just a few slides to uh, to set the scene and uh, and introduce you to uh, what uh, what transformers are what hugging face is what we're trying to build 
And then, of course, we'll uh, quickly dive into a very long demo, uh, trying to highlight most of the solutions that we have out there. Okay, and um, and I'll uh, I'll keep some time for questions. Uh, so yeah, you can you can post um, you can post your questions in the in the Q and A window. I'm trying to keep an eye on it, uh, or you can post them on the chat as well. Okay, so I'll try to answer as many as I can here. Okay, um, so let's let's get started. Um, so I, I guess the first thing we should we should discuss is um, where what's the starting point? You know, of course, I'd love to convince you that transformers and, and hugging face are awesome, but to do that, I, I need to explain where we're starting from. So, what I call deep learning one zero is deep learning the way we've been practicing it, I would say from 2012 to um, 2018 or something, right? The, the first few years where deep learning kind of exploded onto the stage and, and became something that not just a research tool, but something that businesses and organizations could use. So of course the, the foundation of deep learning is neural networks, right? Which is really old technology when you, when you think of it. Um, and it just uh, came back and, and proved very, very efficient uh, for uh, different tasks like computer vision and natural language processing and, and more. So architectures like uh, convolutional neural networks, um, recurrent neural networks, LSTMs, et cetera, all those different neural network architectures have been, have been uh, heavily used and are still heavily used. Uh, of course, to train models with neural networks, you need data sets. And uh, as we all know, uh, deep learning is very, very data hungry, and you need um, lots of data to successfully train a deep learning model. If you're trained from scratch, which is really what people have been doing for years, you need millions of images, um, or at least hundreds of thousands. Uh, you need millions of um, of sentences, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, as the huge majority of those problems are supervised learning problems, you need to label that data. So not only do you need to collect the data, clean the data, um, you need to label it. And, uh, and that's, a, a, that's a lot of work, right? Uh, yeah, that's very, very painful. And uh, although there are some open data sets out there uh, and data sets like ImageNet for image uh, recognition, et cetera, Generally, it's been extremely painful for, uh, for companies to build those huge data sets, and it's been slowing them down in adopting deep learning. Putting the models and the, um, uh, putting the algos and the data together to build models, of course, you need computing power. And, you know, so far, this really means uh, GPUs, right? Um, and, you know, there's nothing wrong with that, um, but uh, GPUs are, uh, you know, they're expensive um, and um, they haven't been designed specifically for machine learning, right? They've been originally designed for, you know, graphical computing and 3D games, I guess. Um, and, well, they're, they're a brute force, right? Uh, they, they get the job done, but they're expensive, they're power hungry, uh, and there's got to be a better solution than that. Uh, and finally, we need to put all that stuff together and write some code to get training going and deployment going, et cetera. And it's really, you know, in the first few years, it, it really meant working with libraries like, uh, you know, the first versions of TensorFlow, the, uh, the first versions of Torch. Um, and, you know, it's fair to say that these are great tools, but they're not the easiest ones to use. Uh, and even now, you know, if you're going to write TensorFlow code or, or, you know, even PyTorch code, you have to know what you're doing, right? You, you need um, a deep understanding of the models, a deep understanding of the machine learning process. And, and let's face it, it's not something that everybody has. So it kind of restricts the field to experts. And, well, we don't think that's a really good thing. So we're trying to reinvent uh, the way uh, machine learning is done today. And the first step is, of course, moving, standardizing um, models with transformers. 
and I'll talk about transformers a little bit more, but uh, in a nutshell, it's, uh, it's a, an architecture uh, based on deep learning um, that originally proved very efficient with natural language processing tasks. And everybody here, I'm sure, has heard of the BERT model from Google released in 2018. That was the, the first major transformer to be available. But very quickly, uh, we saw models for computer vision and audio and speech and many different things. So transformers are really becoming uh, kind of the standard now for, uh, for deep learning and, uh, and even traditional machine learning in a way. Instead of building those huge data sets, um, we can now rely on transfer learning and pre-trained models. So transfer learning, and we'll practice it in the demo later on, is a way to use models that have been pre-trained uh, over a, a huge data set, you know, think maybe Wikipedia or you know, millions of images. And uh, in order to pick up the, the relationship uh, between all the different concepts and patterns inside that data. And this initial training job is a very expensive and complex job, but it's already been taken care of, right? Um, uh, some, some companies, some organizations have already done that for us. So now we can come and grab those models off the shelf and we can either use them as is, maybe they're just good enough, right? Uh, for example, translation models are very often good enough to be used, you know, right there. And, um, or you can take those pre-trained models and fine tune them, train them just a little bit more on your own particular data, domain specific data. And that's what we'll do in, in a minute. And so it, now you don't have to go uh, through Hi, the, the crazy effort of collecting the data, cleaning it and labeling it. You can just, uh, you just need a little bit of data to get the job done. Um, GPUs are still around, obviously, uh, and, and they're, you know, they're still impressive. Uh, but we also see some new companies uh, who are building um, dedicated chips for machine learning, uh, whether it's for training or for inference. And, uh, and obviously, these are, uh, you know, uh, amazingly efficient. And I'll talk about that in a little more in a minute. And finally, putting everything together, you know, we try to, uh, of course, we still need the expert tools for low level work. Uh, we still need, um, uh, you know, the low level libraries, but we also need to have easy open source libraries that everybody can use, even if they don't have a formal education in machine learning. So that, you know, in just a few lines of code, you can just get the job done um, and, uh, and go quickly from your ID to your model without the need for expert skills or complex um, uh, code writing. Okay, and hopefully that's what uh, I'll show you in the demo today. So transformers uh, are this deep learning architecture, uh, as I mentioned, but uh, when it comes to hugging face, transformers is also an open source library um, that um, hugging face uh, stewards and this is one of the most popular projects in open source history. And you know, we, we were really humbled by that and very impressed by the, the adoption that we see in the community. What you see here on this slide is the, um, the number of GitHub stars for different projects. So Hugging Face is um, uh, the yellow line on the left. And, um, and you can see it has, the, it has the steepest slope, right? And so that means we're growing faster than these other cool projects. And, you know, don't get me wrong, uh, we, we have huge respect for all the projects out there and generally all open source. Um, but it's really amazing to see we're growing faster than uh, um, PyTorch and Keras and Spark. And we're even growing faster in popularity than Kubernetes, which is a little bit mind boggling, if you ask me. So that's pretty cool. Uh, and again, thank you everybody for, uh, for supporting us. And if you haven't given a star to the Transformers library, uh, well, now would be the time to do it. I would appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> or maybe after the session, we can always use more stars out there, right? So uh, github.com slash hugging face slash transformers. Please give us a star. Uh, so community adoption is really cool, uh, but of course we want to see industry adoption as well. And uh, well, we did see in uh, in a few uh, in a few industry reports 
uh, like the, the state of AI report or the Kaggle um, data science survey, that transformers are increasingly popular. As mentioned, they're uh, called out as a general purpose architecture for ML. So not just NLP, absolutely not. Uh, you'll see in a minute, we have models for computer vision and uh, speech and, and other things. Uh, and accordingly, we see those traditional deep learning architectures uh, being less popular and transformers becoming more popular. So that's that's a really good sign that there's this shift from, I would say, deep learning to transformers. And just to give you a couple of numbers, um, everybody loves numbers. Well, uh, we have 1 million plus model downloads from the Hugging Face Hub, uh, which lives at uh, huggingface.co. And uh, we serve over 100,000 users every day. And that's still growing very, very quickly. So lots of traffic on that website for sure. So here's the, the family picture before we dive into the demo. Um, we're gonna cover um, quite a few of those building blocks in the demo. So obviously on the right-hand side, we have um, the, the artifacts that are hosted on the, uh, on the Hugging Face Hub, okay? So uh, over 6,000 data sets, over 50,000, 55,000, excuse me, models today. And starting from those, well, you can use the transformers library, which we'll use today uh, to, to train uh, your models with very little code and pretty simple code, as you will see. But you could also use AutoTrain, which is um, our AutoML solution. It's a no-code solution where you just use the user interface to train your models. Um, you can also use the Optimum open source library to accelerate training. I'll talk about Optimum uh, in a, a little more detail in a, in a second. And then when you have a model that you like, you can deploy it on one of our solutions called Spaces. Spaces is a really easy way to build a web app to showcase your models. And of course, we're gonna look at Spaces today. And finally, if you want to deploy for production, well, uh, you could deploy on our very own uh, managed uh, inference API, which uh, I'll show you as well. And, um, and you could use, again, Optimum to accelerate um, inference, right? So that cycle is very fast, as you will see. It's not a lot of code that you need to write, and you can iterate very quickly and get quickly to high quality models. Um, I also want to mention we have uh, cloud uh, partnerships, and um, uh, the first of those is with AWS. Uh, we are uh, Hugging Face is a first-party framework on uh, Amazon SageMaker, uh, so we have uh, uh, Hugging Face containers for training and inference that are readily available in SageMaker, so that you don't have to build them; you can just bring your code, and you can leverage the uh, the the long list of SageMaker features. And uh, a few weeks ago, we also launched Hugging Face Endpoints on Azure, where starting from the Azure Marketplace, you can deploy any public NLP model from the hub to a managed endpoint on Azure. Okay, so, and there will be probably more things coming up. But as you can see, that's the family picture. So quite a few options here open source, uh, you know, run them on your laptop, run them on your server, run them on the cloud. Uh, you know, we wanna be everywhere that you are, right? Uh, maybe just a quick word on, um, on hardware acceleration, which I think is a really, really important topic. So Optimum, again, uh, is I think worth a look. I'll, I'll show you an example of um, um, model quantization at the end of the demo. Um, and basically, Optimum builds on top of the Transformers library to bring you either training acceleration uh, with uh, chips from Abana or GraphCore, uh, and also inference using uh, the ONNX runtime acceleration and the Intel neural compressor. And you will see the API is very, very close to the Transformers library, so it's very easy to move your vanilla Transformers code to, to Optimum. And we also have another collaboration on hardware acceleration, which is not part of Optimum, which is part of the AWS uh, SDK for Inferentia, which is a, a custom chip that AWS built to accelerate inference as the name implies. Okay. All right, that's the family picture. I will share some resources at the end, um, but for now, I think it's time to uh, start running some code. Um, 
So before everybody asks, yes, this code is available. I'll leave it on the screen for a second. Uh, you can grab this whole thing on GitLab here. And, um, and this is actually a kind of a, a self-paced workshop um, that I'm building and I keep adding stuff to it and I'm trying to keep it up to date. So I've picked a few modules um, out of that today. Um, but there's certainly more to, to explore. And if you keep an eye on it, I'll, I'll keep adding stuff. Okay. All right. So gitlab.com and maybe I uh, should, uh, yeah, maybe I can just post that to the, to the chat as well so that you can all catch it. Okay. There we go. All right. So there are quite a few things. Uh, and this is trying to replicate, uh, I would say, a real life project. Um, and so I'll, I'll accelerate a little bit because you know we really want to be running time, but I encourage you to go and read this intro notebook here. Basically, what we're trying to do is, um, you know, we assume that uh, we're working for a retailer selling shoes and we'd like to build a machine learning model that scores um, customer feedback, you know, whether it's product reviews or, you know, um, um, product reviews on our website or product reviews on, uh, on forums or maybe social networks, et cetera, et cetera, okay? And so, you know, to keep it simple, basically we'd like to uh, be able to provide uh, um, an English language review, okay? And score it using the Amazon star rating uh, concept, okay? You, you could do it, you could do positive, negative, neutral, you could do, you know, different things, but here, uh, let's go for stars, simple enough, okay? So when it comes to machine learning, this is really a multi-class classification problem where I'm going to give you an English piece of text, or I should say piece of English text, makes more sense. And, and um, I want to predict um, whether that thing is uh, a one star, two stars, three stars, four stars, or five star review, okay? So five classes, okay? So it's a multi-class classification problem, but you know I mentioned those fifty-five thousand models. Um, so we could take a look maybe at the hub, and you know maybe we're lucky, right? Um, maybe someone already built this. Um, so we could uh, browse the Hugging Face Hub and um, and look for um, you know text classification models for English, and um, and um, and you know, maybe somebody has already shared that. Okay, so there are tons of uh, there are tons of models for uh, sentiment analysis and you know hate speech detection, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, emotion detection. But you know, unfortunately, we or fortunately for us today, uh, we don't have a model to um, to classify product reviews or shoe product reviews for stars. Okay, so we'll need to pick a model that, uh, you know, that's been uh, originally trained and we can pick generally any of the language models for English. Um, you know, we don't even need to start for, uh, with a, a sentiment analysis model. Um, here, I'll just start from uh, this actual model, the distilled BERT model, which is a condensed version of, of uh, the famous BERT model. And this one has been trained on a very large English corpus. So I'll start from there, okay? And we'll fine tune it on our own data. Speaking of which, we do need data. Um, so you could say, well, if, you, if we're a shoe retailer, you know, we probably have some customer uh, reviews and customer posts on forums, et cetera, et cetera. But remember, you need to clean that stuff. You need to label it and it's a pain. And maybe you need to do that to get to the maximum accuracy that you want, but to get started quickly, uh, maybe we can find a data set that just works out of the box, right? And in fact, um, there is this Amazon US reviews data set. Uh, let's click on that. And as the name implies, it's millions and millions and millions of uh, real life reviews from amazon.com. Um, and this is the, the English uh, version of the data set, but there's also a multilingual version of that. And, you know, it's neatly organized in categories. And of course they have shoes, right? 
And, you know, we could just go and, and click on any of those and we see, you know, the product title, the product review, right? And we see the star rating. So this looks like a good start, a good place to start. Uh, we have customer content and we have a star rating. So maybe these are not the exact shoes we're selling, but, you know, I'm guessing if someone's happy with shoes, generally, they're going to say about the same thing, you know, whatever the shoes are. So this is a really, really good place to get started, right? So that's what we're going to do now. We're going to start uh, working with, uh, with this. Um, we're going to start working with this data set and see, you know, where that takes us. Okay, so moving on to the next notebook, let's take a look at those shoe reviews. Okay, so the library I'm going to be using here is really the mostly is the data sets library, which is another hugging face library. So easy to install. And, you know, in one line of code here, I could just download um, that uh, Amazon review data set from the hub. And um, and I can see it's really huge, right? It's over two gigabytes and it's got 4.3 something million reviews. So that's nice, that's a lot of data, but to experiment, I, I don't need that much, okay? So I'll just download it again. In fact, uh, it's going to be cached on my local machine. So that's gonna be fast. You can see here, reusing data set. So you're not downloading again and again, it's cached locally. And I'm going to say, okay, give me just 10%. Okay. That's, you know, that's a reasonable number. And, um, and so we see now we have 436,000 something reviews. Uh, we can see the different columns, obviously. Here's an example. Um, and if we can see the, uh, we can see those, um, uh, all those columns. And there's a lot of stuff here. Um, what we want to keep is really the review body and, um, and the star rating, right? Probably, you know, I guess the product title could be interesting. Maybe other things would be interesting, um, but I'm just gonna stick to those two columns. So I'm just removing everything else, okay? And now my data set looks like this, right? And you can see how easy it is to work with a with a data set uh, library, you know, it's a couple of lines of code to clean th things out and super nice. So I want to check that my star ratings are really what they are, you know, make sure we don't have weird values in there. And in fact, the unique values are really one, two, three, four, five. So good to know. Uh, another thing I could do is count how many reviews I have per, per class. And I can see a potential problem here. We have a ton of five-star reviews and not so many one and two-star reviews. So I guess everyone knows Amazon is, uh, is uh, only selling great products, but you know, when it comes to building a model, um, this, this, is, um, this is a challenge because if we have way too many five-star ratings, then the model is gonna be biased toward that class. So here I'll just run a couple of uh, pandas lines of code and I'll just rebalance everything to uh, make sure I have the same number of uh, reviews in each class, okay? You don't need to get the exact same number, uh, you know, but here, the, I guess the imbalance is almost, you know, it's one to 10 between, you know, one star and five star. So, yeah, makes me a little bit uncomfortable, one to 10, that one to 10 ratio. So let's just rebalance everything we'll have 100,000 reviews, which is still more than we need, right? And we can, uh, we can work with that. Um, the, another thing I need to do um, is, you know, everything starts at zero. Machine learning is not different. And here I can see my star rating start at one. And, you know, if I train that way, I'm gonna run into problems. So I can write a simple function just like this that I apply to the full data set to decrement all the star rating values by one. So now my star rating values are between zero and four, which is what the model expects, okay? All right, so now my data set looks like this and you know, it's pretty cool. So labels are you know, from zero to four and text is just text. 
So I'm going to split this between training and validation. I'm going to keep 10% for validation, 90% for training, uh, which are typical values. And my data set is ready, right? So you can see, you know, uh, really quickly with the data sets library, you can download data from the hub, you can explore it, uh, process it. It's, it's a super simple API. Uh, you can really learn this library uh, as, um, uh, you know, in, in a couple of hours. Okay, uh, next I'm going, I can save that data locally, why not? Uh, and I could load it again, just like that, super simple. Uh, I could e as equally easily save it as uh, CSV data. You know, that's, it's always good to keep a CSV file somewhere. Uh, I could save it to Amazon S3, why not? Okay, or I could use uh, another cloud storage service uh, on uh, uh, Google Cloud or, or Azure to save that data in the cloud. But most of, it, most of all, I would want to push that data set back to the hub, okay? And all it takes is this, just call the push to hub API, give the name of a uh, um, data set repository on the, on, the, on the hub and it saves everything. And so now if I go, let me close this. If I go to this uh, repo, you know, which is in my uh, Hugging Face account, well, I can see this data set. I can, I can explore it. And I see that my files have been automatically saved in a Git repository because in fact, all models and all data sets on the hub are managed as Git repos, okay? So um, we could actually use, uh, we could actually use, uh, uh, again, the, the data set library to load the data set, or we could use the Git workflow to clone the data set directly from the hub, whichever you prefer. All right, so now my data is ready and it's on the hub, right? And um, now it's time that we train something on it. So let's move on to, uh, to this notebook. Okay. So I'm installing a few more libraries and most of all, I'm installing the transformers library, which is the one uh, I'm gonna be using to train, okay? And here I'm training on, um, uh, on this, mach this machine as a, as a GPU, right? So uh, uh, I, I am training locally, but this is a GPU machine. Uh, generally, you know, you would want to have a GPU compute um, or optimum <laughs> acceleration to train. Training on CPU is going to be extremely painful uh, if, if, you know, if possible at all. Okay, so importing a few objects that we'll see in a second. Defining, um, defining uh, a few hyperparameters. So to keep my training time low, I'm just going to train for one epoch. Okay, um, I have to use five labels, remember? Okay, star ratings go from uh, well, zero to four now. So uh, five classes and the learning rate and the batch size and, and a few more things. Um, you could probably use the default values here uh, if, you, if you wanted to, okay. Okay, so I need to load the data, right? I'm gonna pass that to my, uh, to my training job. So, well, I can load it from the hub, just like we saw. Of course, I could load it locally, but hey, let's, uh, let's load it from the hub, okay? So, uh, well, no change, right? The training set, 90K samples, the uh, validation set, 10K, okay? It still looks the way it should, <laughs> so that's good news. Um, and that's uh, pretty much what we need to do um, uh, with the data set, right? It's been prepared already. Um, I would like to see some uh, detailed metrics during my training job. So I would like to see accuracy. I would like to see the F1 score, precision and recall. So I can, uh, I can write um, a simple, or I should say reuse, because I think that's what I did here. I literally copied this from another notebook, um, uh, a compute metrics function that takes the predictions as input and, um, and that uh, will score um, the predictions compared to, uh, to the, the original labels, okay? And you can see this is um, not specific. Um, this is not specific in any way. 
uh, to the to the text classification problem that we're uh, working on here, right? And generally, you'll see that this code, uh, the the transformers code, can easily be reused from one task type to the next. Okay. All right. Um, so now I'm going to grab my model. Okay. Uh, so uh, this model is uh, the base model ID is what I define here. Okay, so it's my distilled BERT model. Maybe we can look at it here. Uh, yep. Okay, so we can see it on the hub, obviously. Um, it's been, uh, you know, you have lots of information on the model itself. It's been trained, uh, like I said, it's a kind of an optimized version of BERT. So it's been trained on a ton of English text, right? So it's a good starting point to understand what customers are saying about our products, okay? All right, so I'm downloading, downloading the model. I'm downloading the tokenizer. If you're not familiar with NLP, um, the, one of the key things you need to understand is words and generally strings mean nothing to machine learning models. Uh, machine learning models want um, numerical data, right? So tokenization is a process that replaces each individual word, each individual punctuation sign by uh, an integer token, okay? And of course, as the model has been pre-trained here, we also have trained a tokenizer that will replace each word in the vocabulary that this model has been exposed to into an integer, okay? We'll, we'll see that in more detail in, in a few minutes. It's not, it's not critical right now, but you understand that. Okay, so we apply the tokenizer to the training set and the validation set, and we kind of do it the same way we did when we decremented the, the star ratings, we write that simple function that just uh, applies the tokenizer to, uh, to the text column in the data set. And we call the map uh, API to process everything. Okay, so very, very simple um, data processing with that map API. Okay, well, so we're done now. The, the data set has been turned into tokens and we can actually go and train, okay? So we'll first define our training arguments, um, where to store the model and how many epochs we wanna train for and the batch size and the learning rate and, and all that good stuff. Again, if you don't know better, you could just uh, stick with the original values here. One important parameter is this one, uh, because as we will see, we can automatically push the trained model back to the hub. So this is where I would like to push it. Okay, in that new repo. Okay, finally, we put everything together with the trainer API, which is uh, super simple and high level. And, you know, it's really my preferred way of training models. So I just pass the model, the training arguments, the tokenizer, the metrics function, the training set, the validation set. Okay, and then I call train. And that's it. Okay, and so this fires up the training, uh, uh, the, the, I should say the fine tuning of this model. And as you can see, we did not write uh, any machine learning code here. And that model that I'm working with is actually a PyTorch model, but I did not have to understand how to train a PyTorch model. I'm just using that high level trainer API to get the job done. And once again, you can see how generic this is. There's nothing here that's a specific to text classification, okay? I'm actually, you know, copying and pasting that code again and again and again across, uh, you know, NLP and computer vision and, uh, and audio examples because it is completely generic. And I think this is really one of the strengths of this library. You don't need to know anything about TensorFlow. You don't need to know anything about PyTorch. And in fact, you don't really need to know much about machine learning at all, right? You just need to understand what data you want to train on and what model you want to apply that to. And, and off you go. Okay, so we see the training here uh, happening locally. Again, we train for a single epoch. So I just see one uh, line of log here. I see the, all the metrics that my compute metrics function computed. I see my accuracy is about 57%. Um, that's a good start. It's not amazing, but for one epoch and five classes, you know, it's probably good enough to, to continue working here. But of course, you would want to train a little faster. Uh, this took about 24 minutes on a, on, a, on a GPU, right? So still pretty intensive. 
Okay. Um, all right. So what's next? Um, well, next, oh uh, yeah, we could evaluate on here on the validation data set, but if you had uh, a test set and other benchmark data set, you could very easily evaluate the data set on it. And of course, uh, you want to save the model. You could do that locally, or you could push it to the hub, right? And when you do that, well, now you know what's going to happen. Uh, you see that uh, this model is now available on the hub, OK? Uh, that information has been added automatically for me, which is nice. Uh, we call this the model card, by the way. Um, it describes the metrics and um, um, and the hyperparameters. And you know, if I had trained for ten epochs, I would see you know ten uh, ten different epochs uh, information on ten different epochs. I see the framework version. All that stuff is created automatically. And you know, it's not magic. It's just a markdown file that's created in the repo and displayed by the hub. And of course, you can edit this and add extra information on the training process. You know, make it very clear uh, what this model is and what it's good for, et cetera, et cetera, right? And I can certainly try this model um, right there. So uh, let's give it a shot. Uh, this should know about shoes right now. So let's try and see what this thing says. Okay, and uh, so this, uh, we call this the inference widget and it's going to load the model on demand um, on the inference API, which is the actual uh, inference service that we built. And, um, and it should predict, hopefully it should predict this as a positive review. Let's, uh, let's see, let's wait a few more seconds. Okay, yes, so labeled four really means five stars. Uh, I could have renamed those labels to make them more human friendly. Uh, these are the kind of the default labels. Okay, so that's a five-star review uh, with a confidence score of 88% or almost, okay? So that's a very positive review and this model is kind of promising, okay? All right, so where do we go from here? Um, well, we have this model, we can, we've pushed it to the hub um, and now it's available, right? It's available for us and for everybody else, uh, in fact. And we could use it um, using the transformers library. We could clone it. So let's try and predict with that model, OK? So the, the easiest way to do this is to use the pipeline API in the transformers library. And all you have to do is this pipeline, the task type, and the name of the model on the hub, OK? And then using that pipeline, you can just predict in one line, right? So it couldn't be simpler. Uh, and you know, again, that pipeline API, if, if you don't need more, it's just you know, the one line way to, uh, to download and predict, right? Super, super simple. If you need a little more control, you can take it down one level, so to speak. And here I'm going to load the model Kind of like when I, I loaded it for training, okay? So I'm going to use those auto star classes. And this model is a text classification model. So I need to use this auto model for sequence classification object, telling it, hey, five labels, please. I am downloading the tokenizer as well. And then let's start from a couple of reviews. And let's tokenize them. Okay, so passing that text, uh, now I'm gonna get integers, okay? So that's what I was referring to earlier. Uh, the, uh, um, the transformation of strings into something that the model understands, okay? So that tokenizer during the pre-training process learned that, uh, you know, uh, uh, this, or the and this are is token 101. And interestingly enough, you can see it's the same token, right? So the and this are tokenized the same way because the concept is the same, right? It's, you know, this thing I'm talking about. So pretty cool. And shoes, I guess, is 1996, okay? Uh, we can add some padding 
Um, in case the, the samples are too short, we can have truncation in case the uh, samples are too long. But in a nutshell, this is what we're doing here, okay? And then we pass those tokens to the model, right? And we get outputs. And, you know, this is where people get confused when they see this for the first time. It's like, well, 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 you know, these are not probabilities, right? Yes, I see five values, one, two, three, four, five. So I'm kind of guessing these are related to the five classes, but these are not probabilities. Well, no, they're activation values, right? They're raw output values from the model. So if I want to make them look like probabilities, you know, generally I want to apply this softmax function. Softmax is a math function that takes a vector of values and um, rescales them so that they add up to one, which are really what probabilities should be, right? So now we can see that first sample, the, shoe fells, the shoes fell to pieces after a few days, has a maximum probability for class zero. So that's a one star rating, very negative. And likewise, the other one is a very positive review and the max probability is for class five. Okay, so that's what soft max does. Right here, you can see this is the largest value largest absolute value. This is the largest absolute value, but of course, they don't look like probabilities. Okay, uh, fine. So now we predicted locally. Let's try and deploy this thing uh, on the inference API. Okay, so how do you do that? Well, you need a Hugging Face account. Uh, so let's go to my Hugging Face account. I should log in. Okay. No, I don't want to change the password. And I'm going to go into settings, access tokens. Okay. And all right, I have a token here called demo, which is probably good for what I want to do. And these are just, you know, access tokens that you can create. And let's go and try this. Is this? Not sure if it's the right one, so let's just replace it. No, it's not the right one. Okay. So what I'm doing here is I'm uh, I'm creating a URL, uh, which is the API inference URL with the name of my model. I'm passing my token as an authorization, and I'm just running the I'm just running an HTTP query, HTTPS query actually, uh, on that URL, passing a payload, right? So let's try that. Ha! Ah. So of course it tells me, hey, the model is loading because all this stuff is strictly on demand, okay? So you could use the inference API this way in a, in a free, completely free capacity, but models will not stay loaded, okay? They're loaded and then they get unloaded after a few, a few hits or a few seconds. Uh, if you want your models to stay loaded uh, and you, you, if you want to pin them on GPUs, for example, uh, you can absolutely do that, but of course you need a, a paid plan to do this. All right, so if I wait a few seconds, the model is loaded and now I can predict just like that, okay? And if this isn't the simplest way to deploy a model to a production API, I don't know what is, you know? I've seen many ways to do it, but uh, I have to say this is the simplest thing I've ever seen. Um, so that's, uh, that's pretty cool, right? That's pretty cool. And there's nothing else, you know, I did not create a server. There's no DevOps. There's no, nothing happening in the background. There's just this one hit on the API to load the model and predict. Okay. All right. Um, so where do we go from here? Uh, now imagine, you know, you iterated a few times on this and, um, and, you know, you have good accuracy and, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's a good model and you're happy with it and you want to show it to your, I don't know, your marketing director or your customers and, you know, they're not technical people, you know, that's okay. But if you show them that, you know, what's going to happen, you know, it's, <laughs> it's not going to be super impressive. They may kind of understand what you're showing them, but it's not what they have in mind, right? What they have in mind is, is an application that just um, uh, looks like a web application. Uh, Jupyter Notebooks, not so much. So what they probably want to see is something like this, right? Um, they want to see an application. Here's one. 
right? So here we have a simple web app um, where we can type a review. Oh, you know what? We're gonna we're gonna take a real one. I'm tired of typing fake reviews. All right, shoes. Oh, no shoes on the home page. That's the first. Okay. Let's grab some shoes. Oh, yeah. Let's just take this one. Okay. And you'll have to trust me. I, this is completely random. Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, how about that? Okay. So let's just take this review. Put it here. Submit. And okay, this is a four star review with 47% confidence. Okay, so still a, a pretty positive review. Uh, and so now if you show that stuff to you know, your customers or your marketing director, now they understand what you're doing here, right? It's like, oh, okay, they could use this. They could test this. If you integrate it that way, uh, if you integrate it that way on your, um, on your um, web app or mobile app, Okay, that's what it looks like. And, um, and this is really impactful. And this is based on the solution called Spaces, okay, uh, which, uh, which is something that we build. And now you, got, you have to guess how many lines of code is this? Okay, so I'll give you a second to think. Okay. And some of you are probably looking at the code right now, so don't cheat. <laughs> okay, it's 15 lines. Okay, the only thing I did is I imported my model. Uh, I created a very simple user interface using the Gradio framework, which is part of Hugging Face. Uh, you could also use Trimlet. And so there's an input box, an output box. And when you click on the button, it calls that predict function that obviously predicts the input, extracts the, 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 the numerical number in the label, and prints out as many stars as required, okay? So that's all there is to it. Uh, the only thing I did is I wrote this stuff. You can run it on your local machine, you can test it, and then you can just push it to a space repo on Hugging Face, and it will automatically create that web app, right? And it's based on containers as you would expect, and you can see the, the container starting, et cetera, et cetera, right? Uh, to for debugging purposes. So Spaces is really great. I, I really encourage you to, uh, to go and, and check them out. Um, this is a very simple example that I'm showing here. Uh, there are many more. I mean, if you've been playing with Dali Mini uh, in the last few weeks, that's what you've been using. But, you know, Dali Mini is fun. And there are uh, literally, you know, hundreds and hundreds of different spaces to work with. And the best way to do this, I think, is when you find a model that you like, um, check out the model page because the spaces that actually use this model will, uh, will be referenced, right? So if you want to see this model in action, if we take mine, uh, yeah, I don't know where that's one, that one's gone. Uh, it doesn't matter, but you can just click on any of those spaces and, and you can test the models in place, right? And of course, the code is going to be available. So this is super useful. You can see how to work with the model. You know, this is a great resource of, uh, for code snippets. Okay. Uh, all right. Very last thing I want to show you is I want to show you how, um, inference optimization. Okay. So now you have your model in production. And you know it's all fine, but it's a big model, right? Those transformer models are really bulky. So maybe it's just a little too slow to predict. So one way to solve that problem is to use Optimum. So Optimum, as I mentioned, is integrated with different chips. Here, I'm gonna use the uh, Intel optimizations. And I start by installing uh, Optimum. And you can see this is a local notebook. This is running on my Mac here. So I don't need a GPU for this. In fact, I, I need to run that process on CPU. Uh, I'm, I'm loading uh, a test set, okay? I'm loading the model that we saw, okay? Same model that we trained, okay? 
I write uh, a, a simple evaluation function that will score the, the evaluation data set uh, on this model. And the reason I want to do this is because quantizing, optimizing models uh, can degrade accuracy, right? Because we're going to, you know, we're going to crack the model open. We're going to do some pretty heavy stuff in there. And we want to make sure we don't hurt the accuracy. Or maybe we hurt it, but just a little bit, right? So that's why we need that evaluation function to keep track of, you know, what the original model predicted and what the optimized model predicts, okay? And in fact, here we use a tool called the Intel Neural Compressor to do this. And we can set a, an accuracy target. We could say, hey, I don't want to lose more than 3% accuracy. You know, I want to speed things up, but I don't want to lose more than 3%, okay? So once I've done this, you know, I can just load that config file uh, using uh, the Optimum Intel library. And you can see how simple this is. Uh, just pass the model to it and call fit to launch the optimization process, okay? So first, um, Optimum is going to compute the baseline accuracy and how, uh, of course, how long that took. So that model predicted the um, evaluation data set that I passed here in, let's say, 18 seconds uh, with an accuracy of 42, 42%, okay? And now it's running optimization on it, okay? So it's, it's actually doing quantization, which is a process where you replace 32-bit floating point values uh, in the parameters with 8-bit eight, um, eight integers. And we can all see how faster, you know, 8-bit uh, integers are going to, to be uh, compared to 32-bit floating point, right? So that's what quantization means. So it's running a first pass where it's replacing some operators. And now it's telling me, hey, uh, so I did one pass. Baseline accuracy was 42%, 56. And amazingly, the optimized model is a little bit more accurate. It's 42.79, right? Um, and there are reasons for that. And you know, I don't have time to explain. But sometimes quantization can actually run faster, um, deliver a faster model, and a more accurate model, sorry. And when it comes to speed, you know, the baseline model predicted in 18 seconds and the optimized model predicts in less than 13 seconds. So that's a very, very significant speed up, right? It's about, let's say, 30%, something like that, right? Just doing that, just doing that, you accelerated your inference by 30% with the amazing bonus, bonus that it's just a little bit more accurate. So that's pretty crazy, right? And of course, we could save the model and push it to the hub and, and do all the usual stuff. But that's optimum in a nutshell. Just a few lines of code and you get pretty cool results, right? Okay, well, that's pretty much what I wanted to tell you today. So um, let me share a few resources. Let me get rid of all this stuff, find my slides. Okay, give me a second here. Too many windows. Yes, here they are. Okay. So these are the resources you need to get started. Uh, so of course, I would encourage you to sign up if you uh, on a hugging face if you haven't done so. Um, the best place to start if you're completely new to this is um, you should go to the tasks page, which will introduce you to all those uh, machine learning tasks, you know, text classification, summarization, um, you know, image classification, you know, et cetera, et cetera, in plain English, right? So this is really beginner friendly. Uh, then you should absolutely take the Hugging Face course, uh, which is also beginner friendly. It's not designed for machine learning experts. It's designed for developers. And if you have questions, you can go and ask all your questions on the forums where the whole team is waiting for you and, and uh, waiting to help, okay? Um, we also have some additional commercial products. I won't spend too much time on that, but if your company needs uh, support, uh, we can help across the, across the board. Um, if uh, you work for a company that cannot use the public hub because you have security and compliance reasons and you want to have an in-house version of the hub with the same tools, uh, we can do that. We can deploy those tools on your own infrastructure, uh, whether on-prem or in the cloud. And if you want to stay in touch, you can follow me on Twitter. Uh, you can follow me on, on my Medium blog. 
and I have quite a few videos on uh, on YouTube as well. So I hope this was uh, this was useful. Useful. Um, I really wanna I really wanna thank you I'm, again. I'm I'm really amazed by the the number of people in here. Uh, I knew analytics video was awesome, but that's you know I'm still shocked. <laughs> And I'm really impressed by the, the diversity here. We have people from literally all over the world. So this is this is promising because you know we need machine learning to solve global problems. So you know from Nigeria to India to Singapore to uh, to Europe to everywhere. You know, thank you so much. You know, get educated and start solving problems. Um, all right. Well, that's uh, what I wanted to tell you today. So thank you so much. Uh, get in touch, ask all your questions on the forum, you know, get started. Okay. And yeah, I see all the, all the cool messages in, in the chat box and I really, really appreciate that. All right. Thank you a lot. Thank you very, very much. And uh, thanks again to analytics video for the invite. Really, really appreciate it. Have a great day. Great evening. Hope to see you soon. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot, Julian. This was really insightful. I would like to thank you for your time and for delivering such a wonderful session on behalf of Analytics Vidya. I am sure our audience found, found it insightful and hopefully we can conduct more such sessions with you in the future.